Prince William's marriage to Kate Middleton marks the beginning of a new and independent stage of his life. William is the new face of the monarchy for the 21st century. On the surface, William appears to be a product of the old order, groomed to be king by the House of Windsor. But William is the son of Diana, the woman who transcended celebrity and transformed the monarchy. The influence of his mother is going to be special. She opened his eyes to the other side of life. It's easy to forget that William's formative years took place in the crossfire of the War of the Waleses. Prince William and Prince Harry, they're, they're children of a broken home. Not just any old broken home, but possibly the most acrimonious and bitter uh, separation and divorce in royal history. Diana's life was steeped in controversy. The government minister has said you're a loose cannon. The House of Windsor tried to disown her, but the media were obsessed with her. Could I ask you to respect my children's faith? How has the life and tragedy of Diana influenced William? And will William be the king his mother wanted him to be? Hi. Hi, Tom. Congratulations. Thanks very much. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay. Like his parents 30 years ago, William agreed to a television interview on the day his engagement was announced. William's mother was this massive, iconic figure, the most famous figure of our age. Is that worrying? Is that, is that intimidating? Does that, does that, do you think about that a lot, both of you? You particularly, Kate, obviously. Well, obviously it'd be... Um, I would love to have met her. Um, and, and she's obviously a, she's a, she's an inspirational woman to, to look up to. And, you know, very inspirational. So. Um, yeah, I do. Can you find the words to sum up how you feel today, both of you? Just delighted and, and happy. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. The story of William and his mother, Diana, begins 30 years ago. She seemed like a perfect bride for Prince Charles. She was young, attractive, she had the, the right background, and we were told that the right background in 1981 meant a member of the aristocracy. I'm not going to say anything. Just very... right, but Prince Charles did give us a hint himself. He said we wouldn't have to wait too long. That was a girl who really wanted to become Princess of Wales. And nobody, you know, she wasn't gonna upset anybody on the way. The perfect marriage was watched by billions of people around the world. It was the last great royal wedding to galvanize the British public. She emerged from this wonderful glass coach. She was on the arm of her elderly father who had who'd suffered a stroke and he did his damnedest to be up, to take her down the aisle. And we, everyone was with him every inch of, as he walked her up the aisle. And she had this amazing dress she was wearing with its endless train and creases and lots of uh, little, pretty little um, uh, bridesmaids running around at her feet. Here is the stuff of which fairy tales are made. It did seem like a fairy tale. Suddenly, the world seemed electrified by Diana. No other royal member of the royal family mattered that year, or I think for, for the next 17 years. It was just her. Within three months, she became pregnant with Prince William. It was a boy. It secured the line. Um, Charles had done his duty. Diana had provided him with a son. At the age of only 20, Diana had responsibility for bringing up a future king. Her first real encounter with the, with the media was in Australia on her first ever royal tour. And I remember meeting her then for the first time. And she was very nervous. She was very jittery. 
When Diana was unsure of what to do on the walkabout, Charles sent her off on her own. But Diana had not expected the level of interest in her. It would have been far easier to have had two wives, to have covered both sides of the street. The tour of Australia and New Zealand was a real rite of passage and a real ordeal. And she was helped to overcome that ordeal with the fact that Prince William was with them on the royal tour. At the age of nine months, Prince William was launched onto the world stage. Does Prince William have a favorite toy? Jamie, he loves his koala bear he's got. Day after day, the only question she was ever asked was, how is William? And she loved to respond to that. She emerged a very confident uh, young woman. They were halcyon days, that period between William's birth in 1982 and Harry's arrival in September 84. They seemed a happy young family. We know that um, Charles was helping out in the nursery. He was cutting short his engagements to be back in time for bath time. Diana was determined he should be involved in the early stages of, of William's life, quite unlike his own upbringing. Another part of William's upbringing involved having to appear in front of the cameras. But there was a problem within the family that would make the cameras a much more intrusive part of his life. Diana's weight loss, of course, did get a lot of mention. I mean, she, she became stick thin. There was concern, but it was, it was explained away by the palace at the time. And we accepted what they said, that it was simply the stress of, of new motherhood, um, coping with a baby, coping with life. In, in the royal goldfish bowl. In September 1984, there was another addition to the Waleses, but it was not the daughter that Charles wanted. When Harry was born, Prince Charles was quite dismissive of both her and the baby. And she, as she said to me, something inside of me died and the shutters came down. Rumours about the state of the Wales' marriage really began from about 1985 onwards, and certainly by 1986, I remember that already um, newspapers were sort of counting the days when, not when Charles and Diana were apart, but when they were actually together. The, the royal couple gave their marriage very little opportunity to flower and to flourish. They were together effectively as a couple for only three or four years. Although her marriage was disintegrating, Diana imposed her influence on William's upbringing. Unlike the four-year-old Prince Charles, Prince William was not going to be educated at home by a governess. I recall the first day vividly. Uh, Diana said to William, who was you know, dressed immaculately in his school uniform, you've got to be you know, brave now because when we arrive there, there are going to be probably 120 photographers. You know, so, and that's what you're going to probably get now for the rest of your life. And of course, he turned around and said, I don't like photographers." We arrived at the school. Diana did her professional piece of that smile. Of course, William completely ignored it, just climbed the steps. We quickly go into this reception room where all these uh, mums and their new kids there. Of course, William stood still. And you could see it that the, the parents dressed in their finery were desperately edging their son forward to, to be the first to say hello to William. But there were very few days in, in William's early schooling that, that, that Diana didn't go with him. I mean, William was, you know, as a young boy, seemed to me to be much more reserved, was, I suppose, in a way, slightly sly character. You never quite knew what you were going to get with William, say, from his brother, who was much more overt. You know, Harry would say to his brother, you know, oh, it's all right for you, you know, you'll be king one day, I won't be, so there you are, I can do what I want. So at a very young age, Prince William knew that he was somebody special. 
I feel the royal duty, in a way, is, is slightly more inbred. It has to be. I mean, it has to be trained, in a way. Diana had done her duty by providing an errand to spare. But now there was something that was going to break the golden rule of duty first. When William was six, the marital problems between his parents came to a head. The journalists, although they suspected, pretty much 90% knew that Charles had returned to Camilla Parker Bowles, that nobody could write it. And so the public were completely left in the dark. At the beginning of 1989, Diana decided to confront Charles and his mistress. On one evening, Diana went with the Prince of Wales to the 40th birthday of Camilla's sister. She said to me, you know, the Prince doesn't want me to come, but I'm going, she said, because I know Camilla's going to be there. Almost immediately, I heard Diana shouting my name outside. Uh, and uh, I said, okay, you know, what, what's going on? You know, she said, oh, well, she said, um, I can't find the prince, can I? I can't see Camilla either, and I need to go and find them. We descended some stairs to a, to a basement. And there was the Prince of Wales sat with Camilla, I mean, just talking. And Diana was incredibly bold, and I, you know, I hadn't seen her do this before. And Diana said something like, look, I know this has been going on for some time, you know, and why do you do it? And to, and to two very sort of stony-faced people, you know, Camilla was the one that, that said, well, it's all right for you, you've, you've got, you know, two lovely boys and so forth, as if that excused what was happening. And it was quite bizarre, it's incredibly uncomfortable for me. And I left. This had sealed in Diana's ideas and in it, that any chance of a reconciliation now is finished. At the age of eight, William began his life as a boarder at Ludgrove School. How are you? Unaware that his mother was planning to break a royal taboo that would drastically change the future king's life. Like generations of future kings before him, William's life is taking on a familiar pattern. His loyalty to the House of Windsor unquestioning. But William spent his formative years caught in the crossfire of his parents' public feud, the War of the Waleses. Prince William and Prince Harry, they're, they're children of a broken home. Um, but not just any old broken home, but possibly the most acrimonious and bitter a separation and divorce in royal history. I would date the War of the Wales is from Diana's 30th birthday, so July the 1st, 1991. Prince Charles leaked a story um, that he had been prepared to give his wife a party just to show that everything was fine with the marriage, but he, he wanted to throw a 30th birthday party for her, and she turned it down, she didn't want it. Whilst waiting on the Royal Yacht Britannia to join his parents' tour of Canada, William was about to become an unwitting pawn in the royal feud. And unlike the nine-year-old prince, some of the media had begun to take sides. Diana just ignored all the dignitaries that were lined up to meet them and rushed up the gangplank to meet the children, embrace them, as a famous picture of them, uh, her arms out embracing them. What nobody really saw was that a few seconds later, after Charles had shaken all the hands of all the dignitaries, he went up and embraced the children exactly the same way, with the same degree of love and warmth. But nobody took that photograph. What was also unseen was the effect their parents' marital difficulties were having on William and Harry. As the children were growing up, they could sense the, what was going on, the stony silences, the shouting matches, the fact that Diana would retreat to the bathroom in tears. And on one occasion, I remember, uh, William pushed some tissues under, under the bathroom door, to, uh, saying, please don't cry, Mummy. She felt so desperate. 
so alone, so constrained by the system. Some of the people who knew her very well were genuinely felt that she was on the edge and on the edge of taking her own life. It was clear that there were major problems, but the assumption always was in those days was that this is the Prince of Wales, he's the heir to the throne. They can't separate. On the verge of self-destruction, as a last resort, Diana decided that if the royal family could not help her, she would turn to the public. At home in Kensington Palace, Diana secretly recorded the intimate details of her family life. The tapes were smuggled out via an intermediary and passed on to a freelance journalist, Andrew Morton. I first heard about the name Camilla Parker Bowles in a working man's cafe in Riseleep in North London. And I met the intermediary there, a chap called James Colthurst, and he played me the first tape. And I put the headphones on, and all around me, these guys were eating bacon and eggs, and I was listening to these tapes. And it was astonishing. I felt I'd gone through a looking glass into a different world. Two weeks before William's 10th birthday, Diana, My True Story was serialized in a national Sunday newspaper. Diana had become a whistleblower and had gone public with her account of life within the House of Windsor. Seismic. It really was at the time. I mean, for the first time, someone had got people, friends of a member of the royal family, talking on the record about the most intimate aspect of this person's life, namely Diana's marriage. It exposed it for what it was, um, the sham that it had become, the unhappiness, the misery that she was suffering. The Morton book actually confirmed and identified to the world from the very person herself, look, I've got a problem here. In a way, the book was her release valve. The night of the first Sunday Times serialization, uh, Diana Cole James said that she's had the, the best night's sleep she's had in years. Diana had gone to bed unaware that she'd opened Pandora's box. Following the serialization of the Morton book, the press interest in Diana scaled new heights. The gloves came off. People were obsessed. I mean, the, the interest was, was phenomenal. The crowds of journalists that turned up to cover every event involving Diana. Four days later, during a visit to a hospice in Southport, the pressure on her was visible for all to see. Life could never be the same for Diana or her son, William. On holidays, for example, William would say to them, oh, we're not going to get any photographers turn up, are we? Because you need a holiday. As if he was saying, look, you need help here, you know, and I hope they don't turn up for your sake. So when the press did turn up, it wasn't a hatred of them. It was more concerned for her that he had a problem you notice in a lot of the photographs and the footage that he's, whenever he's near his mother, he's checking to see that she's okay, which I think is a, a really nice sign from the little boy. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. This decision has been reached amicably and they will both continue to participate fully in the upbringing of their children. Diana told me that they together sat down and explained the circumstances of why, you know, we, as your mother and father, are no longer going to live together, because there has been a breakdown in our relationship, which sadly happens in life. So, yes, they were told about it, but, but given the environment in which they live in, there was too much going on, really, for them to go and sit down in front of the television or something and groan and moan about it. She once said to me that she, she wanted William to see a life that was not just four by four Range Rovers, uh, holidays uh, abroad and uh, country house estates. She wanted him to witness the full panoply of what is modern Britain today. So she took them to amusement parks, uh, she took them for, for hamburgers. It was very clear to me that, that, that Diana wanted them to be in the brackets normal. You know, 
know, diets say, come on, well, we're going to go down to McDonald's or we're, we're, going, we're going to find something from Marks and Spencer's in Kensington High Street. So th this, this whole idea of, of trying to do things with him that other people did was, was very much of, of, of Diana's insistence. I mean, I remember, you know, the Prince of Wales hearing that William had been to McDonald's and had been to Marks and Spencer's and, you know, would say, you know, but why do you need to go there? And I recall, you know, both William and Harry enjoying these, these breakouts from, from, from a royal palace. As well as making life fun for William, Diana was keen to show William another side of life, far, far away from the royal palaces. I remember her taking William very early in the morning, away from the glare of the cameras to the passage day centre to hand out clothing, to hand out food and so forth. And I remember, you know, William there handing out a tea and a coffee or something, and, and this one guy came up having spent the night on the street and said, uh, right, give me that, you know, you know, I'm not interested in you. And he knew exactly who it was. And this was quite a, a, an opening, quite an awakening for William. And, and Diana, I remember in the car back, said, well, you see, William, you see, this is what happens. Not everybody likes us. This was part of Diana's education, wanted him to see what other people did. William and Harry, between the separation and the divorce, were moving from one parent to another. And there was concern that they were being too indulged, as many separated parents do. They try and win the favours of, of the other. But significantly, both William and Harry were moving more into their father's orbit. It was great fun for Prince William. He was introduced to some of his father's country pursuits. That was quite interesting to him. And, you know, it was very, very exciting for him. So uh, he, he started, I think, initially, he was very much uh, uh, his, his mother's son, uh, his uh, mummy's boy, if you like, going, you know, spending a lot of time with her. But then there was a moment of change, um, and that, I think, upset Diana. This tug of war to win the hearts and minds of William and Harry was conducted in private. But what would affect William's upbringing much more profoundly was the war his parents began to win the hearts and minds of the public. Well, I'm well surprised you scored a goal, actually. Surprised? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just making nuisance of myself. A nuisance of yourself? Yes, Pa. That's not very difficult, is it? Well, it's hereditary, so... Ha, ha, ha! Touché! In 1994, when William was 12, Charles retaliated against Diana for the Morton book and became the first Prince of Wales to go public about his mistress. Did you try to be faithful to your wife? Yes, absolutely. And you were? Yes until it became irretrievably broken down. Prince Charles took away the fig leaf when he went on television and was interviewed by Jonathan Dimbleby and confessed his adultery with Camilla Parker Bowles. It was the first time he'd made a tacit admission about his relationship with Camilla. We all went to see a preview of the documentary and I remember just racing out of that uh, preview, um, trying to make sure we got the transcript absolutely spot on, because, you know, this was the most amazing event, the future king admitting that he had an adulterous affair with a married woman. The programme would relaunch hostilities with Diana on a scale previously thought to be inconceivable. When William was sent to Eton at 13, an informal deal was struck with the press to leave him alone. But while the cameras were kept away from William, his mother was secretly inviting the BBC's panorama team into Kensington Palace. The Dimbleby interview gave Diana the signal for her to go on television herself in a kind of riposte. Panorama was a surprise. I know why she did it. It was all part of her 
sort of retaliating one year, 18 months on, from Charles's Dimbleby interview, which she found very upsetting. My impression was she had uh, manipulated how she looked in it, that she, um, from everything, from the way she dressed, to the way she made up, to her facial expressions. After the, the Martin Bashir interview, Diana regretted one thing, and that was talking about James Hewitt and her affair with him. I think the reason Diana felt that she'd done the wrong thing by speaking about James Hewitt in her famous television interview was the impact on the boys. She told the boys that she was seeing James in order to teach the boys how to ride. Then the penny dropped. She had been using William and Harry as kind of like cover for her affair because she was telling them at the time, oh, he's teaching me how to ride. Prince William knew that was a lie. And when he met uh, her at Eton, where, where he was then uh, a boarder, he wouldn't speak to her for a few days because he was just so upset at that deception. Diana always felt that in the court of public opinion, she would triumph. That was her modus operandi. She felt that by giving the television interview, she could speak over the heads of the royal family and connect with the people. She also admitted in the interview that she, there were three of us in this marriage, she said, but more importantly than that, I think, because we all sort of already knew that. Um, I think more importantly was the, her rapier thrust at Charles, in which she basically effectively said he didn't want the job and he wasn't suitable for the job. It wouldn't suit Charles to be the king. And so she was declaring, oh, William should be the next king. I mean, it was a huge moment, not only in television, but also for Prince William, which a lot of people then followed and actually supported that view. Now, that was an awful lot of pressure being placed upon the shoulders of a young boy. As well as questioning his father's right to rule as king, the Panorama interview set in train a series of events that would culminate in tragedy for his mother. No question, Panorama led directly to the divorce within a month. The queen had written to both of them, Charles and Diana, and said, this has got to end, you must be divorced. Diana's greatest fear was losing access and control of her children, because in law, the queen can actually take custody of uh, the heirs to the throne, that is to say, William and Harry. She's here now. On the day the divorce she never wanted was finalised, Diana, Princess of Wales, as she now is, was on familiar ground. Feeling desperate during the divorce, Diana turned to friends who could offer a sympathetic ear. Once it was finalised, the biggest relief was that she was going to be allowed to, to have the children because she would give everything in the world to have those boys. She, she loved them to the ends of the earth. Diana was still allowed to see the children, but she was no longer part of the royal family, which would bring to the surface the issue of divided loyalties for William. You know, even to a boy of 1995, he was 13, he will have seen that his mother was criticizing his father, and he loved both his parents, and it must have been very confusing for him. You can't really tell the impact it would have had upon William, the breakup of his parents' marriage, but his behavior at school changed. I remember I was working as a newspaper reporter, and I had a tip that he'd been involved in a fight at school. Now, at the time, I thought this was a great story, you know, uh, for the tabloid newspaper I was working for, William in fight at school, ticked off by the headmaster. But actually, what I found out subsequent to that was that the boy that he got involved in a fight with had been um, ridiculing William about his parents' breakup. And so it must have impacted on him. Although the occasional story surfaced about William, at Eton he was still far away from the media spotlight. The only time the press came to visit was when his mother called on his 14th birthday. It was a gentle reminder that his mother was still the biggest celebrity in the world. 
even after the divorce, she was a, like a magnet to the media. She would always go with um, a press pack of at least 30 people. She was a big story. She sold f photographs around the world in huge, colossal numbers. I mean, she was an industry, a one-woman industry, if you like. And there were a lot of photographers who, who, who got rich uh, just photographing Princess Diana. It was like a drug. You to get more and more pictures of this woman, you know. She, she looked a million dollars, and uh, you just couldn't stop yourself, you know. There was still major interest in her, more interest in her than any member of the royal family. It was almost as if she had her own court, and she was a star in that court. To cope with this press obsession, Diana recruited an experienced PR consultant as a media advisor. The princess was followed by the media everywhere that she went. They waited outside Kensington Palace, and they would hop on scooters and follow cars. Diana. It was difficult. It was obsessional. Officer, can you move? It was, Officer. you know, 24 hours a day. But it wasn't life-threatening. <laughs> She was very cute about it, very knowledgeable about it. She knew them all. She knew all the cars that followed her. She knew all the scooters that followed her. And she kind of handled it very well. And she always looked immaculate and knew, you know, that she was going to be photographed. I always saw it as a bit of a gray period in her life. Diana's alone in, in, in a pretty hostile world. Diana, we have to remember, had discarded her police bodyguards, taking considerable risk, in my view, at times. For Diana, the rules of engagement with the press had changed. Could I ask you to respect my children's space? As a parent, I want to protect children. Thank you. When William was on a holiday with his mother, he could see that in the land of the celebrity, there were no rules. His mother's life was trouble. It was always trouble with a capital T. But with, with, with Papa, with, with Prince Charles, he could get away from all that, and there was a degree of freedom he relished. Diana couldn't do things with the boys that Charles could do. Uh, Diana didn't have um, royal homes dotted around the country. She didn't have wide open spaces uh, for them to run around in knowing they wouldn't be photographed. And the boys looked forward to that hugely. In contrast to their mother, photo shoots with their father were rare, controlled, and agreed with the press. But back at Eton, it was impossible for William to ignore the strange world of his celebrity mother. When he was 14, stories began to surface in the newspapers about relationships his mother was alleged to be having. Although the school went to great lengths to ensure he didn't see the daily newspapers, when there might be something offensive to him in them, um, it was hard to blot out everything. And also, his friends saw things, his, the parents of his friends saw things. If William didn't like the stories appearing in the press, neither did Diana. So she decided to leak her own. Oh, Diana managed to get stories leaked out through me and through other people. Richard Cape was the journalist she told everything to. It's no secret that on one occasion I was photographed getting into into her car and we'd arranged to, to meet somewhere unlikely, like around the back of Paddington Station. She was extremely careful about what she said to me about her private life because of what I did. I mean, where she could help me would be if someone had reported that she was seeing X and she wasn't, or she would tell me that's not true. Although Diana could trust some journalists to write her version of the truth, she struggled to find someone amongst a sea of friends whom she could confide in. 
Diana had a very hard time trusting people because obviously being in that position, who's your friend? There's many single parents uh, find who are going through a divorce, you tend to rely more on your children. William became less of her son needing her advice and more of an advisor to her. Diana was thinking a lot about her future, how she could strike out on her own, and, you know, talking about getting rid of her some of her clothes. And Prince William famously said, well, why don't you auction them, them off and, and give the proceeds to charity? 85,000. 100,000, 65, 175. I knew she was going to say that, 200,000. The gowns were sold in New York and raised, what, four or five million pounds for charity. We, we tend to think of her as, you know, just a gorgeous princess in glamorous gowns and tiaras, but, you know, towards the end, I think she discarded all that. She was just out to try and make a difference, uh, a big difference. Princess Diana did everything she could to make her children see that there was more beyond the monarchy. There was more than being royal. Having discarded her gowns and tiaras, Diana began her new role, to rid the world of landmines. It would be her most controversial role to date. Angola had 15 million unexploded landmines just scattered in places. Young children playing football on, on the, the local village football pitch were getting blown up. I accompanied the, the princess as a member of the press to Angola. She had the bit between her teeth. She seemed very determined to, do, to make a difference. She ticked us off in the press a little bit, saying that we'd focus too much on her clothes, not the issues that mattered. <laughs> you knew that you were being, in many ways, as a member of the media, being manipulated by her for her causes, but you couldn't help yourself. Diana wasn't just showing William a role for a future king. She was showing him how to walk a political tightrope. Ma'am, the government minister is home has said you're a loose cannon by supporting this campaign. Uh, do you have any reaction to that? Well, Jenny, I'm only trying to highlight a problem that's going on all around the world. That's all. It's been said, though, that you're aligning yourself with Labour policy. Do you think that's wise? Labour? I, I don't know what you're talking about. You're, I, don't, I don't know we what you're talking about. We really need to, to move on. The Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There was a sort of naivety about Diana that I thought was endearing. It was what drove her, what, what enabled her to be compassionate. There was a cynical view that her care and compassion were photo opportunities. But I remember going to Chicago with her to the Northwestern Hospital. We were shown all over, including the premature baby unit. I was very unwilling to allow the photographs into that unit, and so the cameras didn't go in there. There was no difference to the way that she behaved with the mothers, with the children, with the compassion that she showed and the interest and the tenderness towards the children than if the cameras had been there. She was genuinely you know, that sort of person. While Diana was trying to show William how royal celebrity could be a force for change, he was sheltered away at Eton. But what happened next would not only help him understand compassion, but would throw him right back into the media spotlight. I want to welcome all of you, and particularly our guest of honor, Diana, Princess of Wales, the metaphorical by the time William was 15, his mother had successfully forged a new role for herself outside the royal family. But her life was becoming more unpredictable. She had a great deal of fulfillment. 
in her public life, in her public role, but her private life was difficult. I think it was always going to be difficult. Where do you go after you've been married to the heir to the British crown? Who'll take me on, she would say. Who really in their right minds would take me on? I think she was always looking for a man, for the right man, um, and, and probably never found him. In July 1997, Diana took William and Harry to stay with Dodie Fayed at his father's villa in the south of France. Clearly, she'd fallen for him in a big way, who's worked in Hollywood, who's been used to, to, the, to glamour and the cameras and, and a life in the public eye. Diana's time spent on the Fayad's yacht off Saint-Tropez was her final holiday with William and Harry and her final act in the War of the Waleses. She was down in Saint-Tropez on that holiday with William and Harry, and she came over to our boat, and uh, she was so upset. She was almost pleading with us, why are we there? And I said to her, would, would you want me to ring the editor and see if we can perhaps pull out of here? And she said, well, I don't really want that, she said. And then, anyway, she, she went back in the boat. She did this most beautiful dive into the sea. And then she went over to where Harry was on a jet ski, and she got on the back of the jet ski, and she just whirred round our boat on this jet ski, giving this most amazing photo call. So work that one out. I can't. I still, to this day, can't work it out. She only behaved like an aspiring starlet in Saint-Tropez, because Prince Charles was hosting a 50th birthday party for Camilla Parker Bowles. I remember James Colthurst asked her if Prince Charles came to you on bended knee, would you take him back? And she thought about it for a long moment. And she said, yes. This uh, accident happened in the early hours of this morning. The pages started dancing on the, the wooden floors at about 1.30 in the morning. I was asleep, a colleague hammered on doors and windows until I woke up. We're just receiving the, uh, the sad news that Diana, Princess of Wales, that has Diana, in fact... Princess of Wales has died. Prince William was at Balmoral. His father came in to his bedroom, woke him um, in the morning and told him the news. After years away from the glare of the media spotlight, Diana's death pushed the 15-year-old William center stage. By putting aside his private grief and stepping out to greet the public, Prince William had come of age. They were going around looking at the flowers, all the commemorations to their mother, and a lady made a comment to William and then handed him some flowers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. He was just so polite and together, it seemed extraordinary. William really showed uh, what strength he had. On September the 6th, 1997, Millions of mourners around the world watched Diana's funeral. They also saw William waiting in the wings, ready to follow his mother for the last time. Fourteen years after his mother's death, William has a prominent role as a member of the royal family. But what will be the influence of Diana's life on William? Will he want to follow in her footsteps? Clearly, the influence of his mother is going to be special. I mean, she opened his eyes to the other side of life. The first ever patronage he assigned himself to was the Centre Point Centre for the Homeless. Because he will remember and reflect back 
to those days when his mother took him to the, the Passage Day Center, to all the work that his mother had done for the homeless, the aged, the, the dispossessed. William has always been searching for normal. He doesn't, he wants to live a life less extraordinary. And he's found someone who doesn't necessarily have these emotional problems. She doesn't come from a broken home. She comes from a very solid middle-class family. The very fact that he was able to meet, fall in love, and live a quite normal existence with Kate shows that William benefited from that experience with Diana. And he produced a ring? Yeah. There and then? And it's a family ring? It is a family ring, yes. It's my mother's engagement ring. Obviously, she's not been around to share any of the, um, the fun and excitement of it all. This, this was my way of keeping her sort of close to it all.